Um, the Atlantic Sturgeon Board currently does not have a chair or a vice chair, and the uh, commission procedures indicate that uh, the executive director can step in and chair the meetings in the absence of a chair and vice chair. So I will do that, and um, Dr. Duvall has her hand up. Thank you, Mr. Substitute Chairman. I am prepared to offer a motion for chair and vice chair if you would like to consider that at this time. We can, let, let's just go through the, the agenda. We'll do that at the end if okay. that's okay and keep it in order. Great, uh, in thanks. interest of time and, and Kim really needs to take off, I think. So, um, so with that, let's go ahead and um, we have an agenda that was distributed on the briefing materials. It's relatively brief. Um, what I would suggest that we do in the interest of, of uh, travel schedules is flip-flop number four and five. Uh, so we'll handle the um, critical habitat designation discussion and first, and then we will go through the benchmark stock assessment update, if that's okay with everyone. Are there any other changes or additions to the agenda? Seeing none, it, it is approved. Um, the last time this board met was February of 2016, and the minutes were included in your briefing materials. Are there any changes to those minutes? Seeing none, will those minutes stand approved as well? Um, with that, we'll, we'll uh, accept any public comment for issues not on the agenda today. And if there's public comment on the critical habitat or um, the, the timeline, we'll, we can accept those at that point of the meeting. And not seeing anyone's hand up for public comment, we will keep moving forward. With that, I will ask uh, Kim Damon Randall from uh, GARFO to give a presentation on the um, two proposed rules for the, the critical habitat designation for Atlantic sturgeon. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, so back in February, I was here talking about the fact that we'd be having these proposed rules come out in May and that we would come back and talk to you about it. So I'm following through on that commitment. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so our two proposed rules um, published on June 3rd, um, and the citations are there. There's one for the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office that covers the Gulf of Maine, the New York Bight, Chesapeake Bay, DPSs, and one um, for the, uh, from the Southeast Regional Office that covers the Carolina and South Atlantic DPSs. So we had a, a, have a 90-day public comment period that's still open on this. Um, it closes on September 1st. So just to um, familiarize some of you um, with some of the critical habitat basics, I'm just going to run through them um, pretty briefly. So the Secretaries of Commerce and Interior share responsibilities for implementing most of the provisions of the ESA. Um, and authority has been delegated down to the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries and to the Director of Fish and Wildlife Service. Under Section 4 of the Endangered Species Act, uh, critical habitat is supposed to be designated when we list a species if we're able to determine what the critical habitat is. If not, then we have an additional year to designate critical habitat. Critical habitat is um, those specific areas when the, within the geographical area occupied by the species at the time it's listed, upon which are found the, the physical and biological features that are essential to the conservation of the species and which may require special management considerations or protections. It also includes specific areas outside the geographical area occupied by the species at the time it's listed upon a determination by the secretary that those areas are essential to the conservation of the species. So a critical habitat designation is not anticipated to create new regulations or restrictions on fisheries. It's not going to create new preserves or refuges, and it's not uh, going to directly affect private landowners' use of their lands. It will guide federal agencies in um, avoiding and minimizing impacts to habitat that's critical to the recovery of Atlantic sturgeon, and it will continue to require ESA consultations for actions that are funded, carried out, or authorized by federal agencies, so things like dredging projects. Um, this is through the, sec the, per the Section 7 provision of the Endangered Species Act where um, the federal agency have to consult with us, and this is under Section 7A2 of the Act. So if federal agencies are authorizing funding or carrying out an action, they have to make sure that it's not um, likely to destroy or adversely modify that habitat. They also have to make sure that it doesn't um, jeopardize the continued existence of ESA-listed species. And we've had that jeopardy standard since the um, Atlantic sturgeon were listed, so now this brings the critical habitat provision in. Um, and if they are, if the activity is going to destroy or adversely modify critical habitat, then they have to um, modify it to avoid that 
dis destruction or modification. Um, at the time of listing in 2012, we couldn't identify critical habitat for Atlantic sturgeon. Uh, we were sued by two non-governmental -gover organizations for failure to designate critical habitat within the established time frames. Uh, so we entered into a court-ordered settlement that required that we propose rules to designate critical habitat by May 30th, uh, with final rules no more than one year later. Um, so our rule did file with the Federal Register by May 30th, and then it actually published in the Register on June 3rd. So um, just to give you a, a little bit of background on how we went about um, identifying the features and, and um, designating critical habitat, the first thing we did was to identify the geographical area occupied at the time the species was listed. We then identified the physical or biological features that are essential to the conservation um, of the DPSs. We determined whether those features may require special management considerations or protection. We identified specific areas that contain these features and delineated those areas. Um, we considered whether any unoccupied habitat is essential to the conservation of the species. We also considered the economic national security or any other impacts of designating critical habitat. This is called the 4B2 analysis. And whether to exclude any specific areas, um, but not if this results in the extinction of the DPS. And this is a, a provision of critical habitat that's very different than listing. You don't, when you're listing a species, you don't take into account the economic impact. And then we determine whether any area cannot be designated because of an integrated natural resource management plan that a um, military facility has um, that would provide a benefit to the DPS. So the geographical area at the time a species was listed was determined to be the entirety of the range of each DPS, with the exception of areas that are inaccessible to Atlantic sturgeon because of a dam, other man-made structure, or natural features such as falls that are impassable um, by Atlantic sturgeon. Habitat upriver of an impassable dam is considered unoccupied habitat. So the physical and biological features that are essential for the conservation that may require special management consideration or protection, we first evaluated the marine and estuarine environment. We know there's some very specific areas that Atlantic sturgeon aggregate in in the marine and estuarine environment, but we were unable to determine what the specific features of those areas are in the ocean and estuaries. We then evaluated the riverine habitats, and we were able to uh, identify features that are important for spawning. Uh, these are hard bottom and freshwater. It's almost freshwater. So there's a salinity component. Um, growth and development, which is soft bottom, such as mud, um, within a specific salinity range, uh, and water of, a, of suitable temperature and with enough oxygen to promote uh, growth and development. And then migration and movement, so waters that are appropriately deep and un that have unimpeded passage. So for the Gulf of Maine DPS, uh, we proposed habitat in five different areas in the Penobscot, Kennebec, Androscoggin, Piscataqua, and Merrimack Rivers. And this is the full bank width of the um, named river um, with specific upriver and downriver boundaries, and I'll get into those when I get to the maps. So here's the map of the Gulf of Maine DPS. Uh, so the, this is the Penobscot River main stem from the Milford Dam to where the main stem river um, drainage discharges at its mouth into Penobscot Bay. Then for the Kennebec River, it's the main stem from the Taconic Falls or Lockwood Dam to where the main stem river discharges at its mouth into the Atlantic Ocean. And for the Androscoggin River, it's the main stem from the Brunswick Dam to where the main stem river discharges into Mary Meeting Bay. For the Piscataqua River, it's the entire Piscataqua River main stem, including uh, the uh, Salmon Falls River and the Cochica Rivers downstream of their lowermost dams to the confluence of the Pis Piscataqua River. And the Merrimack River is from the Essex Dam, also known as the Lawrence Dam, to where the main stem water discharges at its mouth into the Atlantic Ocean. And these maps are maybe hard for some people to see. We do have these on our website if you want to look at them in more detail. Um, for the New York Bite, we proposed four areas, the Connecticut, Housatonic, Hudson, and Delaware. And again, it's full bank width. So this is the Connecticut River. It's from the main stem, um, or in the main stem from the Holyoke Dam downstream to where the main stem river discharges at its mouth into Long Island Sound. The Housatonic River from the Derby Dam downstream to where the main stem discharges into uh, the mouth of, into Long Island Sound. And the Hudson from Troy Locken Dam, also known as the Federal Dam, to where the main stem river discharges at its mouth into New York City Harbor. And this is just a, a, um, another map shot of the upper part of the watershed. 
uh, the Delaware River is from the crossing of the Trenton Morrisville Route 1 toll bridge to where the Main Stem River discharges at its mouth into Delaware Bay. Um, and there is a specific line of demarcation that was identified in 1905 um, for the mouth of the Delaware River. Um, and that's um, at the um, Liston Point, Delaware to Hope Creek, New Jersey. And then this is just another shot of the um, upper or lower part, sorry, of the Delaware River critical habitat unit. For Ch Chesapeake Bay, we uh, proposed five areas in the Susquehanna, Potomac, Rappahannock, and York River system, which includes the Pamunkey and Mattapanai. Uh, the Susquehanna is from the Conowingo Dam to where the main stem river discharges at its mouth into the Chesapeake Bay. The Potomac is from Little Falls Dam downstream to where the Main Stem River discharges into Chesapeake Bay. The Rappahannock is from the U.S. Highway 1 bridge to Chesapeake Bay. And then York River is from um, the confluence of the Mattapanai and Pamunkey, Pamunkey Rivers downstream to where they discharge into the bay. Um, and then the Mattapanai at its confluence with the York um, up to the 360, uh, Route 360 bridge, and the same with the Pamunkey. It goes up to the Route 360 bridge. The James River is from um, uh, Booker's Dam uh, to the Chesapeake Bay. And then we're switching gears to the southeast. They have one um, single map as opposed to the individual maps that we had for Garfo. So this is the map that shows the um, critical habitat designation areas for the South Atlantic and Carolina DPSs. And they have this on their website as well. So their proposed critical habitat units in North Carolina are the Roanoke, the Tar Pamlico, Noose, and Cape Fear and Northeast Cape Fear Rivers. For South Carolina, it's the Waccamaw, Petey, Black, Santee, Cooper, Watery, Congaree, and Broad River, um, as well as the Edisto, the Combahee, and the Savannah Rivers. And additional water bodies include Bull Creek between the Petey and the Waccamaw. In Georgia, it's the Savannah, Ogeechee, Altamaha, Okamogi, Akani, and Satilla and St. Mary's, which is the, at the Georgia-Florida border. In the southeast, um, they ended up designating, uh, or proposing to designate unoccupied habitat, um, and that's because they identified areas um, above um, impassable barriers that are essential to the conservation of the species. So for North Carolina, they identified um, in the Cape Fear River from Husky Lock and Dam, which is Lock and Dam number three, downstream to Lock and Dam number two as unoccupied habitat. They identified several areas in South Carolina um, in the Watery River, um, from the Watery Dam downstream to the confluence with the, um, the Congaree River, the Broad River from the uh, Par Shoals downstream to the confluence with the Saluda River, uh, the Congaree River from the confluence of the Saluda River and the Broad River downstream to the Santee River, Lake Marion from the Santee River downstream to the Diversion Canal, the Diversion Canal from Lake Marion downstream to Lake Moultrie, Lake Moultrie from the Diversion Canal downstream to the Panopolis Dam and the Rediversion Canal, uh, the Rediversion Canal from Lake Moultrie downstream to the St. Stephen Powerhouse, and the Santee River from the confluence of the Congaree and Watery downstream to Lake Marion. Next slide. Sorry. Um, and then in uh, Georgia, they identified in the Savannah River the main stem from Augusta Diversion Dam downstream to the new Savannah Bluff Lock and Dam. So as I mentioned earlier, the uh, public comment period is open until September 1st. Um, electronic submissions um, can be sent to regs.gov at the, the address listed there. Uh, they can also be mailed to me at the um, Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office in Gloucester. Um, we did have our public hearing and we did accept oral and written comments there as well. So um, we do need your help in collecting information. Um, the physical and bio biological features that we identified as essential to the conservation of the species, if you have more information or different information, it would be very helpful if you were to submit that during the public comment period. Um, we'd love to have more information on the rivers that are included in our proposal. Um, they were based on the availability of spawning habitat, so if there's more information out there on that, that would be very helpful as well. 
Um, bathymetric data for many of the sturgeon rivers is lacking um, and would be helpful to sturgeon recovery. So if that's out there and um, we couldn't find it, if you could send that to us, that would be great. Um, we also welcome any comments on the overall accuracy, quality, completeness, and relevance of the scientific information and data that were considered and any additional data that were um, not considered that you have, um, we would be happy to accept during the public comment period. So that's for the GARFO rule. Um, for the CIRO rule, um, you can submit comments electronically. Again, the address is in the presentation. Um, they can be mailed or hand-delivered to Andrew Herndon in the Southeast Regional Office. And their list of um, requests for help are very similar. Um, so the physical and biological features, um, any information you have on those, the rivers that have been included or excluded um, in their proposal based on the availability of spawning habitat, um, their proposal to include unoccupied areas that are essential to the conservation of the species, they're welcoming feedback on that. Again, the overall accuracy, quality, completeness, and relevance of the scientific information and data considered, and any additional data that were not considered. So for more information um, on the Southeast rules, they've provided um, links to their website in the presentation. Ours, if you go into the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office website um, and go to the Protected Resources Program in Atlantic Sturgeon, you'll find all the information there as well. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Kim, and, and very impressive job of pronouncing some pretty tough rivers in there. So good job. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank NOAA Fisheries. One of the one of the things this board asked NOAA Fisheries to do was to, to straddle one of our meetings with the public comment period, so that we could, you know, get this board together and and contemplate uh, commenting on this as a, as a board face to face rather than via email or, or through through some remote correspondence. So, I, you know, we, on behalf of the board, thank you for doing that. Are there questions for Kim? I don't know if we want to get into specific rivers right now, but I think general questions are probably a, a good place to start. Yes, Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just go over a couple of things that you said. Uh, first of all, um, it's not going. This is not going to put new rules on fishermen, and it's not going to establish um, sanctuary closed areas. And um, that I want to make sure you said. <laughs> and this. And the next thing is, well, what? What does it do? I know you said protect the habitat um, of all these rivers and places. And my question is, is there what else? You know, what are, what's behind this? I mean, I know what's behind this, but I mean, I want to know uh, what are the plans to protect the habitat in these rivers? Uh, can you give me an example? And I'll stop there. Kim. So yes to your first question. Um, and to the second question, um, what this does is it, it, um, it ensures that federal agencies, when they're authorizing funding or um, permitting a project, have to come in and consult with us. And they have to determine, with, working with us, whether or not that project is going to adversely modify or, or destroy critical habitat. So it puts into place um, enhanced protections for the critical habitat. So an example would be um, a dredging project. Um, normally, we would consult on that, you know, whether or not that's going to jeopardize the species. That's how we do it right now. But with the critical habitat designation in place, we would be looking at whether or not it's going to adversely modify adversely modify or destroy critical habitat. Uh, so it's an enhanced protection for the habitat as well as the species. Follow-up, Bill? Oh, you're all set. Uh, Tom Fody. Um, I found it interesting that South Atlantic actually put in places that were unoccupied and Garfo did not because we could have put the Susquehanna River in there to be one of those unoccupied that the dam ever was corrected. We basically have that. And why didn't Garfo look at Uncapaki? Uh, That's my first question. The second question, when you look at projects, I think of the Delaware River, the widening that went on 10 years ago that we tried to stop. Would this help us in that kind of battle to stop? Because there's going to be a whole bunch of projects to deepen channels to basically you know, take care of these super, super bo boats that are coming in. So I'm just wondering how that will be available because a lot of that sturgeon habitat in some of the rivers. So we did look at unoccupied habitat, and for your example, the Susquehanna, um, 
the best available information that we have suggests that they didn't make it above Conowingo, that there was a natural falls there. Um, so in looking at that and then looking at the habitat above the Conowingo where there's lots of other dams, there's not a lot of good quality habitat that, um, you know, is right now is considered unoccupied. That would be something we would really want to get sturgeon to. Um, there's habitat below that they can use for spawning. Um, so we determined that that was what they really need for conservation and for recovery. So that's why we didn't and there wasn't any other case anywhere else where there was unoccupied habitat in the in the Garfo area that was essential to the conservation of the species. And your second question, um, yes, this does help. But when we do a Section 7 consultation on the species and look at jeopardy, we do look at impacts to habitat. Um, but it's generally, you know, they're, they're going to be long-lasting impacts or when the species is there. This gives us the ability to really hone in on the things that Atlantic sturgeon need from that habitat that are essential to their recovery. And if an action is going to take place that's going to cause those to no longer function to serve for the um, species recovery, then that's going to result in adverse modern destruction. And so it does give an added layer of protection. Thanks, Kim. I got Pat Kelleher, Rob O'Reilly, Marty, and then a number of other people on this side. So we'll go, we'll go Pat and then Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kim, thanks. That was a great presentation. Um, I, I'm just looking for a little clarity. W w looking at these maps, um, and especially at the mouth of the river, where where this is going to stop. I haven't gone into the details of the of the critical habitat, the draft. I, is it very specific where this is going to end? I'm looking at, for instance, the the map for the Penobscot River. It kind of goes out into the bay and stops, where others look like it really does stop at the mouth of the river. So. Is there some inclusion of the estuarine and, and marine habitat within this? There is some in some rivers. So you're right, the Penobscot goes down a little bit into the bay, but not fully through the bay um, because the features were not, all of the features were not present in that lower part. Um, the Kennebec goes all the way to the to the mouth of the river. So it depends, you have to look very carefully at the maps. And in the, um, in the proposed rule, the um, areas are very clearly demarcated so that enforcement will know where the critical habitat is and where it is not. Mm -hmm. Rob O'Reilly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kim. And I, I guess my question is about uh, timing. So you indicated September 1 is when the comments are due. And have you already incorporated what Section 6 um, exemption permits have for research? In other words, is NIMPS already in touch with uh, those folks in any one given region? So in Virginia, um, VIMS, VCU, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is part of that uh, permit, and there are others participating as well. So is that already taken into account here? So I think you mean Section 10, right? Section 10 research permits? Okay. Is that what you, I just want, Section 6 is the, the agreements that we have with states where the funding mechanism generally exists. Section 10 is the research permit provision of the Act. So those, those research permits were issued in 2012 and they're five-year permits. So they're, because they all kind of happened together because of the listing, those are all up for renewal and are in process. A follow-up, Rob? Yeah, so I guess my question, Kim, is the improvement of the understanding of the river systems would definitely be um, on those folks who have those Section 10 research permits. So is there already a connection to them um, with National Marine Fisheries Service that's already determined here? Um, or is that something that this information should be sent to them and say, You've got till September 1 if you want to make those improvements. So I don't think they have to, I'm not, I'm not sure if I am fully following your question, but they don't have to make any changes to their permits now. They're fine until their permits need to be um, redone in, in 2017. If they're collecting information, they know that they have, they have annual reports that they have to submit. So if they're collecting information that's relevant to this, we have asked everybody um, to provide a, us with information. The um, Sturgeon Technical Committee actually, for ASMSC, actually peer reviewed the um, documents that we have that were the basis for this. So they were able to provide us with information there. Um, and I think most of the sturgeon researchers, if not all, know about this and will submit information if they have it. Not sure if I covered your question. One more follow-up, Rob. At the very end, yes. So that's that's what I'm concerned about, that 
um, the information about spawning areas and other critical areas that that's already known to nymphs um, based on those who are doing this research? And I think the answer is yes. Thank you. Thanks. Next on the list was Marty. Marty Gary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kim, for your presentation. Um, Kim, I think you know that I've exchanged correspondence with yourself and Julie on some Potomac issues. Um, the entirety of the Potomac up to Little Falls and all of our jurisdiction falls within the listing um, or the ruling. And we've documented Atlantic sturgeon of various life stages uh, throughout, you know, throughout the, our, that area and short nose and possibly spawning short nose. Um, so my question is, um, as this rulemaking goes forward, I think you're aware of this coal ash issue that we have on the Potomac. It's been highly controversial and potentially concerning in terms of harmful impacts, physical or biologically, to, to uh, the sturgeon species. They may or may not be. Um, but once this rulemaking is adopted, um, within a year of May, I think you said, so by next May of 17, uh, I guess I'm wondering, it's not going to be retroactive, is it? The process for the coal ash um, containment is ongoing. I don't know when it's going to end, but at some point, um, that's what our concern was, should there be a consultation with NOAA? And it appears it doesn't need to be done now, I think. And now I'm wondering how this might affect it, if that makes sense. So to answer, answer your question and not go into specifics about the collage, maybe we can talk offline about that. But um, the, once the proposed rule is out, there's a provision in the act that requires that federal agencies conference with us um, on actions that they're going to take during that proposed rule phase. And in conferencing, they have to determine whether or not they think that the action is going to adversely modify or destroy critical habitat. If it does, then we do a conference opinion. Um, so that is a step that we have to take with all the action agencies with projects that are happening right now. Next is John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for all those explanations, Kim. Um, you've already explained about why some of the rivers were designated all the way down to the ocean, some just to the bay. Uh, just following a little further on that in the ocean, not that I wanted critical habitat to be designated there, but for example, off of Delaware, I know there's a relic shoal out there that seems to attract a lot of sturgeon. And uh, that was not considered a feature, yet, you know, the lower Delaware River is fairly featureless. I was just wondering how you made those determinations. So yeah, it was very difficult because we know that there are areas in the ocean besides Delaware. There's an area off of Long Island. There's an area off North Carolina. There's several aggregation areas that we know they go to year after year. We just don't know why they go there. What is it? What is the habitat feature that attracts them to those specific areas? And we dug through all of the literature and information that's out there, and we just could not identify what those features are. Um, and even if you could say something like depth or something like that, it's hard to say what it, what that feature is going to require special management. Um, so how do you change depth in the ocean? You know, what's going to affect that feature? So that was our, our, you know, the hardship. If there is information that comes out afterwards that helps us to really identify what those features are, we can always go back and designate habitat in the marine environment and in the estuaries. Thanks. Last on my list was Doug Grout. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Just a brief question. You had identified in your presentation uh, uh, some of the habitat that is critical for spawning and for rearing, for example, varying salinity levels, also substrate type um, that varies uh, between spawning and rearing. Do, in the proposed rule, do you identify the studies that show that those habitat types um, uh, do occur in the rivers that you've identified? Yes, and that's how we base the areas that we designated. Where they had all of those features. Okay, but you've identified the specific studies that were uh, that you drew from, correct? Yes. Thank you. So that exhausts the list that I had of questions for Kim. So now the board needs to decide what what comment do they want to provide back to to NOAA Fisheries. Um, Max has a few slides to kind of frame the issue. So I'll ask him to go through those, and then at the end, there's uh, he's got some options spelled out on, on potential ways to move forward. So Max, if you could do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so just a quick overview of some comments on the proposed rules that are floating around the scientific and 
management communities. Um, so staff solicited feedback from the Sturgeon TC and also the Commission's Habitat Committee on the proposed rules. Um, as I go through some of these comments, though, please keep in mind that states are developing comments individually. Um, a lot of those are still preliminary, so this is by no means a comprehensive list. Having said that, overall, there is general support for the proposed critical habitat units and their boundaries. Most of the coastwide comments, as I'm calling them, or the comments that apply to both rules were in regards to the process and outcomes of Section 7 consultations. So those comments were more or less centered around uh, timing and efficiency of the process, uh, mainly noting that some projects in the proposed areas may be funded by time-limited grants, and there was also concerns about additional administrative costs that may be associated with the processes. Also, that some federally funded sampling programs and research initiatives that use bottom tending gear may be impacted as a result of these consultations. So that in turn could impact several different species management and conservation programs. Some other general comments were in regards to updating supporting information in the proposed rules. And I have one example up on the screen um, uh, that juvenile sturgeon uh, captured in Connecticut River are genetically unique, whereas this was only suggested at the time of the proposed rule. And so obviously new information has become available since that rule was put together. Um, so comments of that nature. A few DPS specific comments that were received as well. Uh, there was two general themes to these comments. One being in regards to the proposed habitat boundaries potentially being inappropriate based on the best available information. Again, another example on the board is that uh, propo uh, proposed upstream boundaries for the Ogeechee and Satilla rivers are far upstream from known sturgeon populations. And then another theme is in regards to areas that were not included in the proposed rules and perhaps uh, should have been. Um, again, this is based on you know new information becoming available since uh, the rules were, were formulated. Um, again, another example is uh, evidence to support designating portions of the Marshy Hope and Nanticoke Rivers as critical habitat. Um, so as Bob pointed out, there's a couple of different routes that, that the board can go with this. I think the, the most obvious is that the board can submit comment directly. Um, you know, we could collect comments right, right here and now, or the, could all go home and digest all this information you've heard today and, and submit comments via email. But inevitably, a, a draft letter would kind of be circulated via email for comment and review. A uh, second option is for states to submit comment individually, as, they, as some seem to be doing already. Um, these would be kind of more specific to the proposed areas within their jurisdictions. Or uh, the third option would be to do both of these. Um, and just a reminder of what the timeline is for submitting comment up on the board. So with that, uh, that's all I have. Great, thanks. Any questions for Max? Seeing none. I look both ways, Dennis. <laughs> um, what's the pleasure of the board? Uh, it sounds like a number of states are individually working on comments. Um, and, that, and that's great. The board can supplement those with and reiterate some of those if, if you choose to do that the board can and draft a letter that's more sort of coast-wide uh, large-scale con conceptual issues uh, rather than river specific concerns um, the Commission doesn't have to comment at all if, if the states want to do it individually it's, it's up to the group what what's the pleasure of the board Rob well I think I would favor a letter um, and whether or not states submit their comments directly or not I think that uh, the letter can include some of that if the states wish as you're suggesting and also get some input from the TC and others um, and I think it's important to submit that letter great thanks um, one suggestion for for a letter from the Commission and and probably makes sense since we asked Noah to provide us this opportunity to get the board together to comment that, that some comments should be provided from this board 
Um, we've got, you know, 29 days from now to, to pull this together. Is it is everyone comfortable with the process um, of Max continuing to work with the states, pulling together you know, any additional comments that may come from the TC or the Habitat Committee, and and you know compiling the state-specific comments, and we at staff can weave that into a letter and circulate that back to the board with maybe a week or so turnaround time before September 1st, and we can submit that to NOAA. Does that does that seem to work for everyone? And we'll send out frequent and multiple reminders to uh, get, provide some input to staff as we move forward. I've got um, Pat Kelleher, then Doug Grout. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that we need a letter from the commission. Frankly, I mean, it, it's many of these issues are very state specific, and um, I'm just trying to think of what this letter would say, how we're going to construct it, and the time frame that it'll take to to actually get it done if we can do it within the prescribed time frame with the due date of September 1. Doug? Well, my comment, I just saw some suggestions from the Habitat Committee and the Technical Committee that are more broad in nature that I think could uh, frame the, the uh, board's comments. Clearly, uh, each of the states are going to have some very specific things. Uh, uh, that they may want to comment on, and I, obviously the states are going to do that no matter what. But there may be a few things that our Habitat Committee and Technical Committee have come up that uh, provided that, that uh, Max already provided to us here that uh, could be uh, form the framework for, for the board's comments. Well, we've got a difference of opinion to some degree. Um, what are other folks think uh, dr. Armstrong I, I agree with Pat on this one I think Noah's looking for very specific information I think that's the most useful this board can give some very general stuff summarizing with the habitat committee but even the TC's are feeding information that is specific to individual runs so I I don't think it's necessary to comment um, all the states I've talked to will be providing comments, and I think that's more useful to for no at this point. Thanks, Mike. Another hand, Tom. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I think about all the difficulty we gave them when they basically basically listed Sturgeon, and but something good came out of a protecting habitat. So I have no problem with a, a board-based letter letter going out on this. Um, I think if they do something that we asked them to do, then it's just to say even a thank you letter for basically putting this together. That's a simple letter, include a few things on it. There's no problem there. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out letter, but thank them for going through the process and putting this together. And the states will be sending their individual comments in. Simple letter. Thanks, Tom. That's a good suggestion. Um, other thoughts? Dr. Duvall. I agree with Tom Foti. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> I think a I think a general a general short letter that can capture some of the um, the more broadly based comments that uh, Chairman Grout referenced would be good. And you know, certainly as states continue to um, pour through the specifics of the designations, you know, any very specific comments, states can go ahead and submit that, but I would be supportive of a general letter from the commission as well. Dr. Rhodes. Well, I'll weigh in a little bit as a commission. I mean, we can recognize what they've done, um, although it wasn't in any detail. I think South Carolina has been hit with more designated rivers than any state. We have eight or nine and most of them extend 100 miles inland because we have no falls and we have no dams on most of them. So it's an incredible amount of the state. The lower half of the state is essentially in the watershed that has been designated critical habitat. So our response to it will probably be very different than most other states. Not that it's negative, but um, you know, to be a commission that's representing um, the views of all the members we will be 
you know, we don't have four rivers that go in 30 miles, and that's it. We have nine rivers that go in 100 miles, um, and, it, and it extends from the North Carolina border to the Georgia border. Um, so uh, it would be hard for me to see any letter coming from the commission that's going to, that we could support in that way. I mean, there's a lot of um, information will be coming in, and, and a lot of um, fish have been tracked in these rivers. And, you know, in a lot of ways, we think that the designation is probably not representative, and we have commented in the past on that. So, you know, probably be along that line. We got a lot of sturgeon everywhere. I'll take you on the rivers anytime. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of sturgeon is good news, so we're happy to hear that. Um, other, other thoughts? Seeing none, the board seems to be a little bit split. Um, does anyone object to the approach of staff drafting a letter, that, a very general letter, focusing on, you know, thank you for the opportunity to comment. States will, given the, given the specific nature of a lot of these uh, habitat areas and, and river specific issues, states will, many of the states will be commenting on their own. Um, I think it, it probably is worth highlighting uh, some of you know the importance of some of the research that goes on in these rivers and and you know the commission would like to to ensure that you know with the least impediments possible the, the this research efforts that, that take place in these rivers can continue to happen um, you know something along those lines Do, does anyone object to that type of letter being drafted and circulated to the board I guess is a first step and then once folks see that if there's major heartburn with that then we can uh, we, we can regroup and figure out what to do Okay. Any objections to that? All right. Seeing none, we'll go that route. We'll we'll, we'll work on a letter over the next you know ten days or so, and, and we'll we'll send it around to the board. Make sure we get it to National Marine Fisheries by four fifty nine on September first, or, or one minute before the cutoff, whenever it is, Kim. Um, so with that, um, anything else on the critical habitat designations? All right, seeing none, Kim, thank you for coming down. I hope, you, uh, hope we didn't pinch you too tight on your flight schedule here. You can scramble for a cab if you need to. And uh, thanks, thanks again. Uh, the next agenda item in our reordered agenda is the update on the 2017 benchmark stock assessment, Dr. Drew. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Chair. So the uh, Stock Assessment Subcommittee met in July to go to have an assessment workshop where we reviewed the progress on model development um, that we've been working on for this assessment. So we don't have any results to yet. We didn't have any results to review, but we focused on sort of questions about model development, model progress to make sure that uh, the best base data are going into these models to help answer some questions about um, assumptions that we should make and to make sure kind of we're all on the same page about what the um, inputs are going to be. So this included models like um, the acoustic tagging model, uh, a couple of data poor models, uh, egg per recruit and spawner per recruit type reference point models, as well as trend analysis um, and reviewing additional data that was not available to us at the data workshop and some analyses related to that. So. After this, I think we had we made some good progress. After this, we'll continue to work on developing these models and have another workshop in January or February of next year where we will review the final model results, come to some conclusions about stock status, and then be ready for a peer review in um, the early part of the summer of next year so that we can present then the results to you um, in the mid middle of next year at some point. Um, so I think we're, we're pretty much on track for that. Um, and we, I should specify, we're looking at these at both the DPS and the coastwide level for a lot of these analyses wherever possible. Um, so if anybody has any questions about uh, the model development or the data, I'd be happy to answer them now. Any questions? I think everything Dr. Drew said is, is good news. You know, I'd like to highlight there's, there's a lot of work being done on sturgeon at, at you know, federal scientists, state scientists, KD, Max, the whole, whole group's pulling pretty hard on this one, and it sounds like they're still on track, and it's a, these river-specific assessments are, are tough and time-consuming. So, you know, we, I appreciate all their effort, and hopefully we'll have a, a very usable product in a year or so from now, maybe a little bit more. So um, any other, uh, other things on the stock assessment? Seeing none, um, we get to election of chair and vice chair. I think Dr. Duval indicated she had a motion. 
Thank you, Mr. Temporary Chairman, and I apologize for having jumped ahead in the agenda earlier. Maybe I just wanted to get to the adjournment, but <laughs> with that, I nominate Adam Nowalski as chair and Ross Self as vice chair. Thank you, Dr. Duvall. Is there a second to that? Russ Allen, thank you. So the motion is to have Adam Nowalski serve as the chair, Ross Self serve as the vice chair, and that would be effective at the next meeting, whenever that may be. Um, actually, it would be effective immediately, and you would chair the next meeting, um, given that there is no chair right now. Any objection to the motion before the board? Seeing none, congratulations. And Adam, you are now the Sturgeon Board Chair as well as your other responsibilities. So thank you. <clears throat> and with that, um, any other business before the Sturgeon Board? Seeing none, the Sturgeon Board is adjourned.